Good morning, everyone. <coughs> so with this uh, <coughs> weather outside, I mean, when I opened the uh, draperies in my room and I looked outside, I saw the fog, you know, on the sea and the little harbor and all that. I, was that, I thought that it was highly romantic. <laughs> and that I was very glad to be inside and not having to uh, walk between buildings. We just have to go to the cafeteria and then down here, and we are dry and safe. Good. <laughs> so we have a lot of uh, work to cover this morning. Uh, <coughs> and uh, we will talk about measures of similarity and distance. And this may look like a trivial subject, but it is not. It is uh, central to uh, ordination, of course, and to what we will do in the next few days. And I will come back to similarity, to, to especially dissimilarity coefficient, on Thursday when I talk about uh, beta diversity analysis. We will revisit the properties of uh, dissimilarity coefficients in order to choose those that are appropriate for beta diversity study. But that will be on Thursday. Today I will do a general presentation of the uh, main families of uh, similarity and dissimilarity coefficients. And I will introduce you to a concept that maybe you're not uh, totally familiar with. And it is the concept of uh, Euclidean distance. <coughs> what, what is it to be Euclidean compared to being metric? It is not the same thing at all. And it has some importance on our choice of the similarity coefficient. And then uh, I will talk about uh, some the, the basic statistics used in multiple regression, because tomorrow we will use the same statistics in canonical analysis. So I'm still preparing for uh, the introduction of canonical analysis tomorrow. Then Daniel uh, will take over after a coffee break with polynomial regression and partial regression and the important concept of variation partitioning. Okay. Uh, I will uh, g use uh, different uh, documents today as I used uh, <coughs> yesterday. I, yesterday most of my talk was based on one document. Today I will switch from one document to another instead of having a nice PowerPoint presentation. That's my style of teaching. And I think that when I change the document and the <coughs> type of presentation, that makes people wake up. And uh, <laughs> it's good. <coughs> it forces you to uh, try and figure out what I'm trying to do. <laughs> uh, we have a document called Some Measures of Similarity and Distance. Where is it? Uh, I will just open it from here, not day one, it is in day two, some measures S and D, okay. Uh, <coughs> I will talk first about uh, the coefficients for binary uh, measures, uh, I think uh, Daniel already introduced this idea yesterday. When we have uh, binary data, <coughs> we can uh, uh, more or less summarize them. I'll put that a bit smaller. We can more or less summarize them using a sort of contingency table like here with A, B, C, D, A being the double presence for site one, site two, let's say. A is the double presence, D is the double absence, and this here comes the problem of double zeros, and B and C are the number of uh, variables or species uh, present only at, uh, only at site one or only at site two. So when, uh, for two vectors like this, it's easy to count how many uh, have double presence, so we go through the vectors, we have one here, another one there. So here we have A equals two. What? Squares A, B, C, and D here in this example, A equals two. How many are present on, only in the site one and not in, in site two? 
here's one and there is another one. We have a two here. Tell me if I'm making a mistake. Sometimes when you're too close to the screen, you don't really see things well. Uh, here, how many are present in site two and absent in site one? Uh, we have one here, and that's all. So we have one. And how many uh, double zeros do we have? One and two. OK. So from that, we can build all the coefficients. Here they are expressed in form of similarity for presence absence data. And I introduce here the two families of coefficients, those that keep the double zeros as an indication of similarity, and those that simply discard the value d, as Daniel explained yesterday. So these are the symmetric coefficients, because a and d are considered in a symmetric way in the construction of the similarity coefficient. And here is an example of an asymmetric coefficient, where d is removed from the equation. So here, the similarity is simply the double presence plus the, double, uh, the number of double absence, a plus d, divided by the sum total. Here, it is the same thing, but without the d. We remove the d portion to obtain this. This is called a simple matching coefficient, and it is nice and good in taxonomy, where you can look at presence or absence of some structures or something. And here is the Jacquard coefficient, the most famous of all similarity coefficients. Designed by Paul Jacquard, a French botanist who was working in the Alps. Uh, and uh, he used that coefficient in uh, 1896 for the first time. And he wrote it in a paper with these letters A, B, C, and D in 1901. So it is very old coefficient. But uh, old doesn't mean that it is out of fashion. Quite to the contrary, it is found in all packages that do this sort of calculations. And uh, <coughs> of course, the, this idea of removing the D uh, portion is based on the theory of uh, gradients in ecology. And I think Danielle mentioned this. This is a figure from a paper by Robert Whitaker. Uh, we will talk again about Robert Whitaker on Thursday. He is the man who defined the alpha, beta, and gamma diversity uh, concepts. And uh, he was working at uh, Cornell University and built a big lab where they develop numerical methods. This is where Mark Hill worked <coughs> in particular, and, and uh, Hugh Gauche also. And the idea is that if you have a gradient, an ecological gradient, like going up a mountain, for instance, you have species that succeed one another, each one having its optimum. Uh, at some point along the gradient. Like if you are going up the mountain, uh, in the low altitude, you may have this species that feels very good there. And then it is replaced eventually by other species that are more adapted to the conditions at higher altitude, the dryness, the wind, and all that. And <clears throat> it is because of this idea of uh, uh, <clears throat> species having an optimum at some point uh, the, this is called a unimodal distribution that we exclude eventually the D portion from <coughs> the comparison. It's because when we have a double, z a double one, it means that the two sides, for instance, for this species are close to one another. They are under that curve. Uh, but a double zero may mean that the two sides are here and there to the left of the curve, or on to that side, to the right of the curve, or one is here and one is there. So we cannot interpret double zeros. We don't know if it means that the sites are similar or that they are very far apart. And ecologists, in general, remove the double zeros because of that. So this is a, a very interesting concept that uh, <coughs> the choice between uh, Asymmetrical and asymmetrical coefficients is not based on mathematics. It is based on ecology. Okay. So there is a whole family of these coefficients. And for uh, frequency data, species, presence, absence, or gene, uh, <coughs> allele uh, presence, absence, the data, it's the same thing. 
uh, they are <coughs> often used in the binary form, present substance, and uh, then these uh, coefficients uh, <coughs> here are very much in use, and the two that will be, uh, there are three actually that will be used a lot based on ABC. Uh, this is the Jacquard uh, community, uh, coefficient of community. We will use also the Serenson coefficient that gives double weight to A. You have 2A here and 2A, 2 times A in the denominator. This is a Serenson coefficient and uh, <coughs> very much in use. And the third one is the OKI coefficient that has a more complicated equation where <coughs> the, in the denominator we have the, uh, <coughs> the geometric mean of the, uh, the sums uh, a plus B here, A plus B is the sum for that site. Let's say, did I put one or two? This is site two and this is site one. So the sum for site one would be A plus C and A, A plus B for site two and in the denominator you take the ge geometric mean of these two. And uh, these coefficients, they are the, the limit for presence absence data of other coefficients that handle quantitative data. For instance, the <coughs> Sorensen coefficient is the limit of the percentage difference called Brain Curtis in some software. And uh, the uh, OKI coefficient is the limit of the Hellinger distance and the chord distance. While the Jacquard coefficient is the limit of another coefficient quantitative for quantitative data called the, uh, the uh, what's it called again? Ruzitsky, something like that, coefficient. <coughs> okay, so, so much for the, pres uh, the presence absence data. Now I'll give you two examples of coefficients for quantitative data. <coughs> Uh, the best known of the coefficients for quantitative data is the Euclidean distance, where you simply take the difference in values in the, between the two values. Here the difference is 5. Square it, and you do that for every variable, and you take the sum of these squares and take the square root. So this coefficient has a lower bound of 0, but an upper bound that it can be any large number. It can, it can really be larger than, uh, than one. For instance, the distance between here and the sun in microns is larger than one. <laughs> that, that's an example. So, yeah, this coefficient does not have an upper bound. Uh, for uh, beta diversity studies, we will see that there is a strong advantage in using coefficients that have an upper bound. So this is another reason why the <coughs> Euclidean distance will not be appropriate for these studies. Uh, but you have already seen in the examples pr presented by Daniel Barkar yesterday that the Euclidean distance produces the wrong answer when we apply it to some simple data, like the small example that he showed of the Orlotsi paradox uh, data, the three sites with the three uh, <coughs> species abundances. Uh, Euclidean distance showed that the two sites that had no species in common at the smallest distance. Doesn't make sense for an ecologist. Mathematically, it is perfectly all right. So again, the decision between this type and this type of coefficients uh, <coughs> has to be made on the basis of ecology. Uh, OK, so much for the Euclidean distance. There are other coefficients for quantitative data, and I will describe in a moment the uh, Gower index that is very useful, but not for species presence abs uh, abundance data. Here is the, <coughs> the percentage difference. In this slide, I was still using the old terminology, Brian Curtis. So this is a percentage difference. Uh, why the <coughs> I uh, suggested to use the original name of a percentage difference is that first this coefficient was properly described by Odom in 1951 under the name percentage difference. Second is that Brin Curtis in 1957 did not describe a new uh, dissimilarity coefficient. Their paper was about a new ordination method. 
And <coughs> they simply said, we use this coefficient that was available in the literature. And the coefficient that they use is not the one known as the Brin-Curtis coefficient. They never used the, the Brin-Curtis coefficient in their paper. So there's no reason to call it that way. People who wrote software and called it that way have never read the Brin-Curtis paper. <coughs> so let's go back to the original name, which is the percentage difference. <coughs> but of course, in software, we have to know that this name, Brin-Curtis, is just synonymous to what we want to do. The idea of this coefficient, here it is presented first in the form of similarity, and then we turn it into a distance coefficient. The idea is that for each species, we will consider that the similarity between two sites, let's say that I have a site here and a site there, okay? And the similarity is if you have that much of a species at this site, and that much at that site, then the similarity is the minimum of the two numbers. And we add these minima to compute the similarity. The, the difference between the two numbers is the difference. So you can also uh, rework this formula to uh, <coughs> write it in terms of the difference between the two values. But here, I wrote it in terms of the of the minimum, that is the similarity species by species. So for these numbers, here are the minima, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1. And the sum of the minima is the, uh, the essence of the similarity between the two sites for these five species. But <coughs> it, uh, the sum is 15. We would like a coefficient that is between 0 and 1. So. We wonder what is the largest possible value that this sum could take. <coughs> it will be the mean of the sum of <coughs> the abundances at site 1, which is 20, and at site 2, which is 22. So <coughs> if W is the sum of the minima, so the similarity will be W divided by the mean of A and B, which are the <coughs> the two sums uh, of sites 1 and site 2. Okay? And so the, uh, the 2 migrates there, <coughs> giving you 2w divided by a plus b. It's, that's the basic form. This is the similarity form that was described by a Polish mathematician uh, called Steinhaus <coughs> during World War II. And uh, we know that. Uh, I have never found the, the papers of Steinhaus. They were probably destroyed uh, during the war, may, maybe. But uh, this work was reported by other mathematicians, uh, Polish mathematicians, after the war. It was published, republished in uh, 47, 49, and so on. And then later authors picked up on these reports to say that this here is the Steinhaus similarity coefficient. And we turn it into a distance by taking 1 minus that, because this formula is bounded between 0 and 1. So you can take 1 minus the similarity to obtain the distance. <coughs> but we will see that this distance is not without problem. <coughs> First, I will have to describe some additional properties of these <coughs> similarities. Uh, but before I do that, I will go through two of the, similar, uh, of the other dissimilarity coefficients that we often use. And then I will go back to the transformation of similarity into distance. And this is the tricky part of the operation. Okay. Uh, this is a description <coughs> of the chi-square distance. This is the distance preserved in correspondence analysis. So it is an important one. And we will see the domain of application of that distance by examining what this formula does. <coughs> uh, first of all, if you don't consider this portion here, <coughs> this is the value of the variable at site 1 and at site 2 for species j. This coefficient is strictly 
for frequency data like species abundance data or gene <coughs> frequency data. Okay? You cannot apply this coefficient to uh, quantitative measurements of salinity, pH, and things like that. No, this coefficient is not for that. It is only for frequency data. And so with frequency data, you can add, when you have the data table, you can add the rows to say what is the total number of individuals found at the site. It would not uh, mean anything if you did that on uh, physical or chemical variables, adding temperature to pH to salinity and so on. It would be meaningless. So <clears throat> you see that in the construction of this coefficient, the, this operation of dividing by the row sum makes sense only for frequency data. You do that for site one, you do that for site two, and if you did only that transformation, this would be the transformation into species relative frequencies, what we call the profile transformation. And again, forgetting about that, the rest of the equation is the Euclidean distance applied to these frequencies transform by dividing each one by the rho sum. Okay? So that's the shape of the Euclidean distance. That is, take the difference for each species, square it, sum them, take the square root. Now, what is this part? This part is a weighting of that difference by the total abundance of, the, of each species in the data set. So here I made up a small data set. I think I should replace that example for the one that Daniel Borcar showed that has six species. It looks more meaningful. But for the calculation, this is enough for you to understand what we are doing. So I have these three sites, three sites with five species again. And here are the row sums. And now we will take into account the column sums. So if we first transform each value here by the row sum, we obtain these values. And the distance between species profiles would be the Euclidean distance between values of that table. N now we will have these values that will intervene, where we have the column sum here divided by the sum total, 87. Uh, <coughs> this actually has little effect on the coefficient. It is this that has a very important effect. When we divide by a small row sum, like 10, or even values that can be smaller than that, it means that we give high weight to this squared difference. Whereas when we divide by a large value of the column sum, this gives a low weight to this squared difference. So at the end of the story, when a species is abundant in the whole data set, then it receives low weight in the calculation of the distance. But when a species is rare in the whole data set, it receives high weight because it is a division by this column sum. What does that mean ecologically? It makes a lot of sense uh, for ecologists to use a coefficient like that because it means that a rare species, when it is found at two sites, is a better indication of a different, uh, of a, a similarity, of a similarity, yes, than finding a common species at two sites. You will always find uh, a ubiquitous species, a species found everywhere. You will always find it in the comparison of two sites. So it, it, it contains little information. But a rare species found at two sites, it may mean that these two sites have some property, physical or soil chemistry or whatever, that uh, makes these two sites suitable for that species. And it is for that reason that <coughs> uh, the chi-square distance and hence correspondence analysis is uh, interesting for the analysis of community data. However, uh, in 1986, uh, we had a workshop in, uh, we held a workshop on numerical ecology in Roscoff in uh, Brittany. Professor Scardi was uh, present at that uh, workshop. 
and, uh, and other people, of course. There were about uh, 50 participants. And uh, in the morning, we had uh, presentations of methods by methodologists and statisticians. We even invited the psychometricians to talk about their methods and so on. And in the afternoon, there were a working group of ecologists uh, <coughs> discussing uh, the application of the, present, the methods presented in the morning to their data, to the ecological data uh, in the afternoon. And uh, <laughs> when we discussed the, the application of these uh, coefficients, of this coefficient in particular, uh, it produced uh, uh, an opposition between two groups of ecologists. Some ecologists were saying, oh yes, we want to use this coefficient because of that salient property that, you know, it gives higher weight to rare species and it is very informative. And other ecologists were saying, well, in my case, my rare species, they are badly sampled. So I cannot trust the values that I have. Uh, <clears throat> and we realized that people who sample things that they see, like vegetation, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, when you uh, look at trees, they don't walk away, and they are very, very nice and all that. So you can, uh, you, you can trust the fact that when you counted a rare species, it was really there. Uh, while uh, other ecologists that sample things that are moving or s sample in very small units, like uh, insect traps, for instance, there may be a rare species present in the surrounding, but that you don't find in the trap because it just passed by, <clears throat> because the units are very small. So uh, we concluded that when you can trust your rare species data, then chi-square distance is fine, and this is what you want. But when you cannot trust your rare species data, <clears throat> don't use the chi-square distance because it gives high weight to data that are very variable because of the sampling. And uh, at that point, we were stuck because, uh, as Daniel uh, mentioned, uh, <coughs> uh, at that time, we thought that for ordination, uh, it was either principal component analysis or correspondence analysis, or then principal coordinate analysis, of course, but the two main... Uh, contenders were principal component analysis and correspondence analysis. And uh, we cannot trust principal component analysis because of the double zero problem and because it implements the Euclidean distance. And we, now we cannot trust correspondence analysis in half of the cases because it gives high weight to rare species. So for about uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, the literature developed in trying to find ways of removing rare species from the data table before computation of correspondence analysis. Daniel even developed one of the best methods to do that, to decide which of the rare species should be eliminated. And <clears throat> by uh, eliminating them, first the most rare, and then looking at the result of correspondence analysis, and then you eliminate the next rare species and so on, you go by steps and you look at the eigenvalues of the uh, axis that you obtain and the, the total uh, chi-square, and you make a graph of that, and then you can decide where to stop eliminating rare species. So that lasted until about the year 2000, and in, uh, at that time, in discussions with uh, Daniel in uh, our lab and with Eugene Gallagher at the University of Boston, <coughs> then we thought about the transformations. And I think that gave, gave us a, a new avenue because with the transformed species data, then uh, we could use principal component analysis on species abundance data instead of correspondence analysis in cases where we could not trust the rare species abundance. Okay, so that's the story of the development of ideas in this field. But it is important to understand this property of the chi-square distance. Is that clear for everybody? Or you have questions about that? Yes? Uh, in the case uh, we don't want to give as much weight to rare species, uh, is it possible just to transform uh, the original matrix uh, by, for example, uh, some uh, transformation for the... Uh, simply a transformation, I don't, 
I don't see which transformation would work. I, I mentioned that we can eliminate the rarest of the rare species. Yeah, and uh, that uh, during 15 years, people pr uh, develop different methods to choose the species to eliminate. Yes, that's one, that's one possibility. But then if you simply transform the species data using the Cord or Hellinger transformation, uh, then uh, you can use principal component analysis, and principal component analysis in that case is, uh, uh, it does not react to the presence of the rare species. So you can just leave them there. You don't have to remove them. Removing them or leaving them there produces the same result at the end. So it is easier. But then you have these two choices, eliminate the rare species and go to C CA, or keep the rare species but transform the data and go to PCA. Other questions? Yes. If we maintain the rare species, maybe it's the same, uh, and then uh, transform, we transform the, our data for uh, log plus one, for example, no? We remove uh, the importance of a uh, the species. Yep. And, uh, yeah, the log transformation is, is another, yeah, it is another and, uh, possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for instance. Uh, if you uh, want to try that, uh, if you take the spider data that you were working with uh, yesterday for ordination, uh, try to do an ordination with, of the spider data after log transformation, log of x plus 1, uh, <coughs> or the Ellinger transformation, and do a PCA of, of these two. And the PCAs are very similar. Uh, but the log uh, transformation is not sufficient for what we will do on Thursday <coughs> because the, the distance at the end misses some uh, important properties. But for just for ordination, this is fine. It's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, for this topic. This is a very important topic for ecologists, you know, what to do. People, some, but people are telling us to do this. Others are telling us to do that. Why? I'm trying to give you the lines of reasoning leading to these different solutions. And then you decide what to do. I don't know. That's your decision. Okay? <coughs> Good. Now I'm going to talk about another important distance, the Gower distance, that was developed not for species abundance data, although there is a form of the Gower distance that can be used for species abundance data, but this is not our main concern. The Gower distance has suddenly gained in importance uh, for the study of species traits, for instance. In the FD pa package, for instance, uh, the basic uh, calculations for the, <coughs> the, uh, the the, the trait, the, the functional, the, the, that's what it's called, the functional diversity in the seas, uh, you can base it on the calculation of the Gower distance, and this is what is done in the FD package. So people now want, want to understand that distance, and I'm going to explain it quickly. It is available in several R packages, but the different R packages don't necessarily implement the Gower distance uh, to its full extent. So I will try to describe how it works and what are the main variants of the Gower distance. For instance, in Wegen, the Gower distance is calculated correctly for quantitative data only. But then if you have uh, factors, is it okay for factors? No, I don't think uh, Wegen takes factors. But other packages take also factors. And then there, uh, there's the problem of uh, missing data in Vegan, it doesn't handle missing data. In FD, it handles missing data. And then you can add weights also. <coughs> FD does that. Vegan does not do it. So here I'll describe the application of the Gower distance for quantitative data. And then I'll briefly run you over what to do for factors and uh, presence absence data. This is an example of seven variables. Uh, let's say that they are physical or chemical variables of the environment, the water, the soil, whatever. 
and, uh, and here I limited the example to small values. And we are going to compare two objects from a data table that contains, suppose, suppose it contains 50 objects. And here I made up two objects that don't really exist. One that has the minimum value in the whole data table, and the other one that has the maximum value in the whole data table, just for illustration. In a real data table, there would be a search through every variable to find the minimum and maximum of each variable. So the uh, basic equation is the one at the top for the Gower coefficient, which will be a sum over the different variables of a small similarity, small similarity because I use small s, okay, computed for each variable. So you compute the similarity between 0 and 1 for each variable. You sum them, and you divide by the number of variables. That's the simple and but very efficient method that John Gower uh, developed uh, during the 1950s to solve this problem that was a problem commonly found uh, with ecological data and with uh, uh, taxonomic data as well. Uh, there is a video somewhere on YouTube where John Gower recalls the story of the development of that coefficient and what it was to use a computer at that time. That was before the invention of the, uh, the uh, computer, uh, the, the, <coughs> the programming languages. The first one was Fortran, Formula Translator, for Fortran. Uh, and, but before Fortran, what did you do? You had to program in... Uh, uh, computer uh, language, uh, basic computer language in <coughs> uh, hexadecimal, uh, in <coughs> using hexadecimal code in many cases. So he tells the story or what it, of what it was to compute a, a similarity coefficient at that time. That's nice. So uh, he developed, uh, uh, yeah, John Gower was the successor of Ronald Fisher as chair of statistics at the Rotamsted Experimental Station. Uh, and he spent his career developing methods for numerical taxonomy and for ecology. Uh, he was with us at uh, the conference in, Ra in Raskov that I talked about earlier. Uh, okay, so what do we do here? For each of the variables, we will use for quantitative data this small index. So this is... Uh, uh, standardized similar, uh, dissimilarity, and we turn it into a similarity for each variable j. <coughs> so first we compute the difference between the two values. So the difference for variable 1 is 1. The difference for this variable between the two values is 2, and so on. Here there's no difference. We put a 0. Now we look at the range in the data matrix, that is the difference between the minimum and maximum, and we find it here. Here the difference, the maximum difference that you can find is 1, the maximum difference that you can find in the data table is 4, and so on. So you divide the actual difference by the maximum difference to obtain these values, okay? and you turn them into a similarity by taking 1 minus that and you obtain this. And we sum all of these. This is what we do in the, in the upper equation. Uh, <coughs> okay, this is the sum. Then we divide by the number of variables, which is seven in this case, and we obtain this similar similarity. Now, if we want to use it as in, in uh, the R language, everything has to be a dissimilarity or a distance. So we can take 1 minus that to obtain now uh, this similarity. This dissimilarity will not have the property of being Euclidean that I will describe in a moment. And so we'll wonder what to do. Uh, but then if we have other types of variables, uh, presence-absence data are handled with this same equation. That is, if the two values are identical for presence absence data if you have uh, 0 0 or 1 1 uh, then uh, you obtain a similarity here of 1 here. or it is 0 for multi state 
uh, factors, qualitative variables, you use the same logic. That is, if the two sites have the same state, you will produce a similarity of one for that variable. And if it is not, if the two sites do not have the same state in the multi-state qualitative variable, you put a zero. So it is easy to handle uh, this sort of uh, variable. Now, there has been some dis uh, uh, the four, i start again, four uh, ordered variables. Uh, John Gower was simply treating them as being quantitative. There, has been, there have been some uh, later proposals, especially by Janos uh, Podany in Hungary, to re rework the, uh, the states of uh, an ordered variable in different ways. And this is described in the uh, documentation of the function uh, Gower, this in uh, FD, for instance, uh, or, or in my book. <laughs> uh, but uh, then uh, this is a small, uh, small point. The, the other main point that I would like to mention is that using this formula here, the formula at the top, we can add weights to these and to the, uh, these small similarities. And then when we give different weights to these variables, here instead of dividing by p, we divide by the sum of the weights. So this is rarely used, but it can be useful in some circumstances where some variables are linked together to code for one thing. So you may want to give them less weight than other variables that are used fully. But the main use of that idea of giving weights to variables is that it can handle missing values. If you have a missing value here, you don't want, well, you could, of course, exclude this variable from the data set. This is what most software would do. But an, a more intelligent software would simply exclude this missing value from a comparison where it is found, but for a comparison uh, with another uh, site where a, 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 the value is not missing, then it would keep the variable. So the idea is now to say, if there is a missing value here, you exclude this variable from the calculation, so you have one small similarity less than for the other site. So you count how many of these variables do not have missing values, and you divide here by that number, so by the sum of the weights, because the trick is to say that if you have a missing value, you give a weight of zero to that comparison. But if the values are fully present, you give a weight of one. So by summing the weights, you can then have a correct coefficient that will exclude data, uh, the comparison, only when there is missing value. So this is a great advantage for our kind of data, especially for physical, chemical variables that we collect in the field. If the pH meter uh, runs off, the battery is off, and so on, you, don't, you have a real missing value. It is not a zero. And here you can exclude these values from the comparison. Or uh, people who work in paleontology, uh, and if you code characters found on fossils, fossils are rarely complete. So sometimes you have pieces missing. You don't know what's the value of the variable that you want to measure. You put uh, NA in the data file, mis meaning missing value, and this coefficient will handle the data correctly. So there are all sorts of applications for this sort of thing. And all that is available in the uh, Gaudis function of the FD coefficient of the FD package. OK, so a very useful coefficient de developed by John Gower. Uh, there are, of course, many other coefficients. And I will mention many of the, other of the quantitative coefficients that uh, are in this uh, group of the, uh, <coughs> of the uh, asymmetric coefficients uh, when I come back to this subject on Thursday. Uh, now, when uh, <coughs> I showed that many of these coefficients were first computed, 
or described as similarities. And when we want to turn them into dissimilarities, then you can do it in different ways. Uh, I uh, changed the version of this uh, handout, some measures S and D, on the web page last night, and I added this page from my book. Uh, that it is useful to have it in this uh, handout. Mm. And uh, so you can later go, uh, go back and uh, download the, the new version that has this extra page. So to <coughs> we are mainly concerned with transforming similarities into dissimilarities because in our all <coughs> packages that use this uh, sort of matrices, they require that they be dissimilarities. So there are three ways that uh, we can use to do that. We can, and the most common is to take one minus the similarity when you have a coefficient that is already between 0 and 1. Or then you can take the square root of one minus the similarity. And uh, this has also been suggested, but there is no, not much use for that form. So the, a big decision will have to be made between this and that. And it is not a trivial, uh, a trivial thing. It, you will not obtain the same result at the end. Uh, I will just mention that for coefficients that do not have a fixed maximum, for instance, if you had, uh, if you had a, a coefficient uh, like the Euclidean distance that does not have a fixed maximum, then you could take each value and divide by the maximum in the data set to obtain a norm value of the similarity that is between 0 and 1. Or you could do it in that way also. And this is if you want to turn the distances into similarities, but we don't want to do that in R. So I will now discuss the difference between that and that. Okay. And this is a more mathematical uh, subject. So if you are allergic to mathematics, you can go and have coffee immediately uh, <laughs> because uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the mathematical uh, parts. So uh, <coughs> let's see. I'm going to go to my chapter on distances. And I will go to page 3.11, which is the definition of a proper distance. Oops, I went too far. Huh? No, it is not 311. Uh, yeah, here it is. <clears throat> so the, this is the mathematical definition of a proper distance. <clears throat> a proper distance has a minimum of zero. And then uh, other values that are not zero, they are positive. You cannot have a negative distance. Okay, makes sense. And then all the distances that, uh, Daniel? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Good idea. <clears throat> Okay, so the first two properties are pretty obvious. And then uh, all the distances that we will also describe are symmetric. That is, if you compute it between site 1 and site 2, or between site 2 and site 1, you obtain the same value. So all these, the first three are found in all our coefficients. Number four is uh, an important one, the triangle inequality. This is what makes a, a distance metric. A triangle inequality is something that seems to be uh, trivially <coughs> simple. So if you have three points, x1, x2, and x3, and you look at the distances like this, <coughs> 
So the sum of any two distances is larger than or equal to the third one. It cannot be smaller. Uh, equal to, it would mean that we have between x1 and x3, we have this. And then x2 may migrate there, x2. Then this plus that would be equal to that one. But it cannot be smaller. Now, what happens with many of our distance coefficients that we use all the time? Uh, I will go now to page 311 to give you an example. Uh, it will be easier for me if I scan at lower resolution. Here's an example. Uh, I'll put bigger. Yep. So this is the kind of data that makes that f makes full sense for ecologists. We may have <coughs> three sites with five species with these values. No problem. Here I apply the <coughs> the distance corresponding to the Sorensen binary coefficient, where we have <coughs> Sorensen. is 2a times over 2a plus b plus c. And the distance here is 1 minus the similarity of Sorensen. Okay? So I, <coughs> in other words, it is uh, b plus c divided by <coughs> b plus c divided by 2a plus b plus c. This is what I use here. So we calculate the three distances between site 1 and 2. We obtain 1. Between site 1 and 3, we obtain 0 0.5, 0 0.25. Between site 2 and 3, we obtain 0.43. This plus that is smaller than that. Maybe I did a mistake in my calculations. Try it. You will see. I would be surprised if you found another result. Okay, so here is a coefficient that we use all the time that violates this, <coughs> this, uh, this rule of, uh, for a coefficient to be metric. I will now show you the same thing for another example a bit further down. Uh, I think it is next page. Yes, here I am with the percentage difference alias Brian Curtis. In my book, there is a note at the bottom of the page explaining this story that I was telling you about <coughs> the coefficient <coughs> not being what it is supposed to be. And uh, here is another example from uh, Laszlo Orlozzi, who was a vegetation scientist. And uh, <coughs> then another example, quantitative data. So uh, between 1 and 2, we have that. Between site 1 and 3, we have that. Between sites 2 and 3, we have that. Well, this plus that is smaller than that. Another violation of the triangle's inequality. Uh, well, these two coefficients that I showed, this one and that one, are related because this one is the binary form of that one. But many of our coefficients uh, violate the triangle inequality. When we come to ordination, this is where I want to uh, take you. When we want to do an ordination with principal coordinate analysis, principal coordinate analysis can be imagined like uh, one of these games that uh, children had in the old days before kids received electronic games. You know, real games that you can handle with your hands where you have, for instance, uh, blocks with holes and sticks, and you can assemble the sticks and try to make a construction. So kids learn to manipulate things, and they may learn some principle of geometry, and they may learn the, uh, the idea that some distances are not Euclidean if they cannot uh, really uh, close their constructions. What happens with this sort of distances, especially if you have a lot of these distances that are not Euclidean, is that uh, some of these triangles will not close. 
<coughs> because if you want to, if you have a uh, <coughs> uh, joining unit here and there, and you have a stick here, then another joining unit <coughs> there, then you will have this going to, to that, and here the stick will not reach there. Okay? <coughs> Uh, so you have problems. You cannot fully represent your distances by a fixed construction. Are there people from Brussels in the room? Nobody from Brussels. You have been to Brussels? Many of you may have been to Brussels. You may have, been, have seen the, uh, the symbol of the uh, uh, international exhibition of 1957, I think, the Atomium, where you have balls like that with corridors in between. Well, imagine that some of these corridors are too short. People will walk in them and poof, just <laughs> fall at the end. So this is what uh, is the consequence of this uh, violation of the triangle inequality. Some of the sticks are too short to reach the other end. And in principle coordinate analysis, we are trying to produce a Euclidean representation of a multivariate data set that contains all these distances. And if you have distances that are too short, the method will still be able to produce a fully Euclidean representation. But for that, it has to borrow some pieces of distances to make the sticks long enough for the construction. But at the end of the list of the eigenvectors, you will have to pay for that by having ugly things called negative eigenvalues. Negative eigenvalues measure the amount of variance that has to be invented by the method of principal coordinate analysis to make the construction fully Euclidean in the first uh, group of variables. But then at the end of the list, you have these extra axes that have negative eigenvalues to compensate for the variance that had to be borrowed, that had to be invented to make a fully Euclidean representation in the, let's say, in, if you have 100 points, you will have 99 axes altogether. In the first 90 axes, it will be fully Euclidean. But in the last nine axes, you may have negative eigenvalues. So what do we do with negative eigenvalues? The first solution is to forget about them. And if you want an ordination in two dimensions, and you will use the first two axes that have big positive eigenvalues. So even if you have small negative eigenvalues at the end of the list, you can just forget about it. Uh, the first two axes will still, be, will still provide you with a uh, good representation of the distances between the points. But we will see different applications in this course, including on day number five, where we will need all the eigenvectors. Uh, we will see that also uh, yeah, tomorrow <coughs> when we will use uh, principal coordinate analysis as a method of transformation of the data. And what we will do is to start with a data matrix here, Y, produce a distance or dissimilarity matrix D, go to principal coordinate analysis to turn that again into a rectangular data matrix. And hopefully, we want this new data matrix to recuperate the information on all axes because we want to uh, use this the dissimilarity matrix, the dissimilarity function, as a transformation of y into this that will then be used in RDA to compare with uh, a, a matrix of uh, environmental variables where we will have uh, that y transform compared to x environmental variables. Okay? So in that case, principal coordinate analysis will be a transformation of the data through a well-chosen dissimilarity measure. We'll do that tomorrow. And in that case, we want to recuperate all axes. But if we have some axes that have negative eigenvalues, 
what happens to the eigenvectors? So I have to go back quickly to the, the document PCA, CA, and PCOA that, for which I showed you yesterday only the PCA portion. And there, it, there is an example of PCOA in there. And Danielle did not quite go through all of that. In PCOA, quickly, you start with the, your distance matrix. You transform it like this. Each distance is squared and multiplied by minus 1 half. Then this matrix is centered <coughs> by using this equation. And uh, that makes the rows and the columns sum to 0. In the ordination diagram, it simply brings the centroid of the cloud of points in the center of the ordination diagram. But we will see uh, on Thursday that this transformation will be used again to find very interesting coefficients for uh, beta, uh, beta diversity studies. The diagonal values here will be very useful. But then, after this transformation and that one, we compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And this is where the negative eigenvalues pop up when there are some. But then the eigenvectors in principal coordinate analysis, they are, I told you that the function eigen of R produces eigenvectors that have a length or a norm of one. We change that norm in principal coordinate analysis. We, meaning John Gower, told us to change that norm because this is the way to reconstruct the original distances. We change that norm by taking the eigenvectors that are just fine, coming out of eigen, and we multiply them by the square root of the eigenvalue. What is the square root of a negative eigenvalue? Mm. An imaginary number, quite right. And when we multiply our a real number eigenvectors by an imaginary number, we obtain a complex number. And how do you represent a complex number in an ordination, or how do you use it in an RDA? Uh, I don't know how to program that. Maybe some physicists would, but I don't know. So we have been looking for ways of changing the, this, the distance matrix if it is, this is what it is to be not Euclidean. It is to have the sticks that don't fit, and it translates into having negative eigenvalues in the principal coordinate analysis. Actually, the, the not the criterion, but the, the diagnostic for non-Euclidianarity, that's a word invented by John Gower, uh, the diagnostic is to do a principal coordinate analysis of the distance matrix and look at the eigenvalues. And as soon as there is a negative eigenvalue in the list, uh, <coughs> we say that it is not Euclidean. There is a function in R. It will be found in my practicals this afternoon. And it is, is dot Euclid. is Euclid of some metrics. And the answer is true or false. OK? This function is in the package ADE4. We ask this question about the metrics, and the function tells us if it is true, it is Euclidean. False, it means that it has negative eigenvalues. Okay. So it is easy for us to check that. And there was a lot of uh, discussion on how to make a distance matrix that is not Euclidean to turn it into Euclidean. And uh, at first, uh, John Gower suggested two corrections that were already available, but for other purposes in the literature. One is called the Lingo's correction, and the other one is the Cayes correction. <coughs> uh, Michele, I found uh, a discussion between you and uh, uh, Daniel Chassel about that uh, back in 1997, I think. I received copies of that from Daniel. <laughs> uh, OK, so it is not a trivial question. But then, uh, a bit later, we found that there is an even simpler way of turning a non-Euclidean distance into Euclidean. And that works in almost all cases. And it is to take the square root. 
root of the distances. Ah, taking the square root of the distances is what we had uh, not here, uh, not here, uh, no, that, yeah, some measures S and D. Is, it is what we had here. Okay? So in all those cases, with all these distance coefficients that do not produce uh, Euclidean distances, we can solve the problem by taking the square root of the distances when we change the similarities into distances. Or since R produces this similarity or distance matrices, we before use, we simply take the square root. You just write SQRT of map, and that takes the square root of each value. And this is what we feed into principal coordinate analysis. And boom, the eigen negative eigenvalues disappear. <laughs> Isn't that great? Now, is that a trivial problem that concerns only one application in the 10,000? Not if you are an ecologist. Because most of the dissimilarity functions that we use in ecology are like that. They can produce negative eigenvalues before, because they are not Euclidean. And there is even a case where, uh, 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 because they are not metric, I mean, even metric coefficients can produce negative eigenvalues in some cases. And there are tables in my book in chapter say, uh, 7 saying which of the similar, dissimilarity coefficients are metric or not, and then which one are Euclidean or not. Some may be metric, but not Euclidean. And the concern is those that are not Euclidean. This is where we have the, to take the square root of D. Uh, to terminate this subject, I can show you just a picture, oh, again produced by John Gower, uh, in my chapter 9, page 500. Oh, the famous page 500. It is, where is it? Yeah, here it is. See, page 500. <coughs> a very, very famous page for a very famous picture. This is an example of uh, distances that are metric but not Euclidean. Look at that. We have four points, one, two, three, and four. For each triplet, we have a well-shaped triangle where the sum of two distances is larger than the third. This, this one, and this one. But then in this triangle, x4 is there. In this one, x4 is here. In this one, x4 is there. The distances are too short. When you make a construction with several points, they are too short for x4 to meet in one point. And that exists in our data. We have that all the time. And this makes a coefficient, not an Euclidean. So it produces negative eigenvalues in principal coordinate analysis. This problem is uh, created a lot of turmoil in the literature, so much that some, in some packages, they said the coefficients that have this property, we should never use them. Well, that would be a hindrance for ecological analysis because most of our coefficients are like that. In other packages, like the primer package developed at Plymouth, there's somebody from Plymouth here. On the, yeah, so uh, the package developed by uh, uh, Warwick is uh, <coughs> for many years, it did not have principal coordinate analysis because principal coordinate analysis could produce negative eigenvalues. And they pushed on the metric multidimensional scaling for that single reason. Now principal coordinate analysis has been reintroduced since about the year 2000 in the primer package in the extension, extension called E-Primer. And peace has resumed <coughs> among uh, users because now we know that with this transformation, uh, <coughs> we solve the problem of the negative eigenvalues. But you see, when faced with problems like that, e ecologists and developers of software have tried different solutions in good faith to try to offer 
uh, their clients, uh, things that would work. Uh, <clears throat> but now, uh, with a bit more research, we find that there are solutions that can satisfy everybody. 